Great, thank you everyone. I hope everyone had a good lunch and uh, I'll probably just kick off uh, straight away into the session but I'd like to just give a quick overview of the Carbon Trust in case uh, you're not sure of what the organisation consists of. But essentially the uh, Carbon Trust is a, uh, a not-for-dividend company that is funded by government with the aim of reducing carbon both now and in the future. The way it reduces carbon now is to help organisations to reduce their emissions by offering consulting advice as well as some funding. Um, in the future, uh, it's focused on new technologies, uh, providing funding for research and investments into those, and to also create markets for those new technologies. The Carbon Trust Standard, uh, on the other hand, is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Carbon Trust, and it is self-funded, and our our role is purely certification, so we provide certification for organisations that can demonstrate that they're measuring, managing and reducing their carbon footprints. I work for the Carbon Trust Standard. My role is to engage organisations and, and help them through certification. So I, I think some of the things that we'll cover this morning um, are, are, I'll be touching on again, uh, but we've had a good overview of the CRC, so I'm going to specifically be focusing on the early action metric and how that works. Then I'm going to be looking at, uh, in more detail at the Carbon Trust Standard, what the requirements are um, and how you can prepare yourselves before the CRC. And finally, looking beyond the CRC and how you can position your organisation in, in a low carbon economy. <coughs> so as Marie uh, covered this morning, the way that the legislation is going to work is that, um, in principle, all organisations will be required to forecast their footprint for the year ahead of them and to pay allowances for the emissions that they'll be producing in that year. Six months later, those allowances will be recycled back to participants, but not necessarily in the same proportion as you pay them in. It will be designed to reward participants who have, or companies or organisations generally that, that have performed well and there will be a penalty for organisations that have performed poorly. So the, the, it's revenue neutral to the government, so essentially the, the uh, people at the bottom of the leaderboard uh, or the league table will, will essentially fund those at the top. Now there's two, two, two metrics when the um, uh, CRC is, is in its cap phase, which is uh, from 2014 onwards. And the two metrics will be the absolute reduction metric and the growth metric. However, that would disadvantage any organisations that have that have moved early, and as a result, they have introduced two early action metrics. And uh, the two early action metrics that have been accepted are automatic meter readings uh, on a voluntary basis or smart meters, uh, and also the achievement of the carbon trust standard or equivalent. Um, the message behind this is take action early, and I think it was uh, raised by a couple of speakers this morning. The benefit of taking action early is uh, far outweighs trying to strategically place yourself at the top of the league table by burning as much carbon as you can now, and then suddenly at the, at the start of the CRC by reducing it. Quite simply, the cost of energy for every tonne of carbon is somewhere between 150 and 180 pounds per tonne. The at-stake portion in the CRC is about £2.40 per tonne. So it's a small incentive over the large incentive of reducing your energy costs. So how will this all work? All the, the organisations are ranked in the league table and the, essentially the position will be decided by uh, your performance in the preceding years. But in the early action metric years, the, well certainly the first year, the only metric that has any weighting is the early action metrics and uh, it, I think there was a question this morning about what's the weighting of each. AMR or, uh, is 50% and the carbon trust standard or equivalent will be also 50%. So essentially by preparing yourselves by, by uh, achieving the carbon trust standard uh, over as much your organisation as possible will essentially help you uh, a, 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 as well as doing the same with AMR. The important point to mention here is that there, there is a proportional coverage. So if you're covering 20% of your organisation with voluntary uh, half-hour meters, you'll only get 20% of credit towards your early action component. And the same is true of the carpenter standard. 
So the, the, the advice here really is to draw the organizational boundary of your carbon trust standard and smart meters as big as possible, certainly bigger than your CRC footprint. Um, as Marie mentioned this morning, uh, the early action metrics now have a longer life, so in the second year it's now 40% as opposed to 20% that was before. And in the third year it's, it's 20%. So what does this look like graphically? Uh, there's a, there's a, an accelerator that, that takes place here. Um, every year, whatever you pay into the scheme, uh, will, your recycle payments will, will, uh, will yeah, certainly will, will be accelerating year on year, because it's plus or minus 10% in the first year, plus or minus 20, and certainly all the way up to plus or minus 50%. It's very difficult to work out exactly what your recycle payments are gonna be in the following years. But certainly in the first year, we've got a worked example to give you some sort of an indicator of, of really what's at stake. So for an organization that emits 50,000 tons of CO2, it's very easy to work out exactly what your carbon allowance will be because it's, it's at a fixed price of 12 pounds per ton. So for an organization that's spending between five and seven and a half million pounds roughly, um, you could be looking at about 600,000 pounds of allowances Plus or minus 10% in the first year would mean that you are looking at um, about 100, 120,000 at stake, being at the top or the bottom of the league table. There's also a double accelerator that's going on because it's not actually the percentage of allowances that you've, you've paid in, but it's actually your proportion of your percentage of the total pot that will be calculated on. So, it potentially could be more than 20% of what you paid in the, in the second year. The key date here, you've seen this, this timeline this morning, the key date I want to mention here is when you need your automatic meter readings and when you need to have a carbon trust standard certificate is April 2011. That's essentially the date that you need to have um, both of those early action metrics in place. Right, so I'm now going to focus a little bit on the Carbon Trust Standard, and wherever you see uh, the Carbon Trust Standard logo, you'll know that it's saying three things about the organization that, that's displaying it, that it's measuring, managing, and reducing its carbon footprint. It's a voluntary, it's a voluntary, cer uh, certific sorry, voluntary certification, and it's focused on um, actual results. So I think there's, there's historically been a lot of... Uh, uh, certifications that are based on uh, commitments to reducing in the future, possibly declaration of your, of, of your carbon footprint, but it's the actual results that will be able to enable you to, to achieve the carbon trust standard. So we're looking at your organization retrospectively, so we really are looking at uh, uh, three years of, of history for any CRC participant, and we're looking to see that you're, you're measuring, managing, and reducing. It's also a good form of discipline and a good, good practice in terms of preparing yourselves for the CRC, in terms of helping you to make sure that your data collection is robust and is, is going to be sufficient for the environment agency when you're audited for your CRC footprint. Now, it's important to mention at this point that the carbon trust standard wasn't designed specifically to address the CRC. Essentially, we're looking at your organization as a total, and uh, we're looking at your total carbon footprint and, and ultimately we'd like to, to, to capture 95% of your footprint and measure that. So where the CRC is looking specifically at your energy data, we're looking at your total footprint and in the first certification, or first two years, we're looking for basically your scope one and two emissions. If you're familiar with the greenhouse gas protocol, you'll recognize the, uh, the, the, the terminology here. Scope one being direct emissions, that would be, would be any emissions that uh, are, are result from burning fuel on site. So that would be gas, coal, heating oil, etc. Uh, scope 2 emissions would be uh, electricity, because the emissions are actually taking place at the power station. And also in scope 1, we've got owned transport. And that's one of the big differences between the requirements of the data for this, the carbon standard and the uh, CRC. We are looking at, your, at, at any vehicles that are owned or leased by the organization. And again, as I've mentioned, we do follow the greenhouse gas protocol methodology pretty closely. So we 
recommended operational control approach, if you're familiar with that methodology. So that means that anything that's in, within your operational control, whatever you're operating or have decision making over uh, how it's operated or what's bought uh, as part of it, falls within your responsibility. So in the first year, we're just looking for the, the, the information in the dark blue box. Um, two years later, you need to, to reapply for certification. So we're looking for the same data again, plus uh, we're also looking for process emissions. And this would probably affect you if you were in manufacturing. Um, essentially, this is CO2 or any other <coughs> greenhouse gas that uh, results from any processes that take place. This is not the energy required for those processes. But if you're manufacturing <coughs> cement, for instance, um, the actual chemical process, when you're making cement, releases CO2. So we'd look to, to, to capture that. Fugitive emissions would be any refrigerant gas loss. Um, and that certainly uh, has a huge effect on, on large retailers because all their re refrigeration plants are uh, a significant portion of their footprint. For the average type of organization that's office-based, it might even fall under, under de minimis. Our de minimis rule is anything less than 1%, you can exclude. But you need to obviously demonstrate that it's less than 1% and you can exclude up to 5% in total. So we, we want to capture 95% of the organization. And then the third area, scope three, which is other indirect, uh, that would be business transport. <coughs> the, 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 the data we're looking for there would be for any, any form of transport using planes, trains, taxis, um, or, any, or any business use of private vehicles. So really, any, any transport that, that, that's used for the purpose of business needs to be, be, be collected for that. Now, when you're applying for the standard on the first certification, you don't need to, to capture those in the light blue blocks, but you need to start collecting that data now for the recertification. The data in the white blue blocks, may, may, they, they are voluntary submission, so you may want to include them if uh, you're doing particular work in that area. And I know a lot of organizations essentially are already doing work with helping staff commuting, uh, cycle to work schemes or car share schemes, etc. If you're doing a lot of work in that and, and you're showing re reductions there, you may want to include that data as well. Um, waste disposal, product distribution, etc. All of these are voluntary, uh, but we actively encourage you to, to, to include those because ultimately that is taking total responsibility for your footprint. Just to, to, to discuss the requirements of the data, the scope one and two, we, we are looking for primary data. So that would be kilowatt hours or liters of fuel. Uh, scope three, because it's somebody else's scope one, uh, we, the, the data requirements are, are less rigorous, so, or less uh, uh, demanding, should we say. Uh, so essentially, uh, ideally we'd like air miles for, for flights, but if we can't get that, we'd be happy with number of long haul flights, number of short haul flights. So there are a number of ways we can uh, work with uh, less than perfect data on scope three. And the final thing to say on the slide is your organizational boundary. It's important to uh, draw your boundary in such a way for the CLC that you're covering at least the size of your CLC footprint. We are able to do certifications for smaller boundaries than, than that. So you could either do a uh, certification for your entire organization globally or just the UK, possibly for a geographical re region, or possibly even a single division or a single site. Whatever boundary definition you choose that needs to be clear uh, and, and easily understandable by any stakeholders inside and outside the organization. So that's the measurement. We've, we've been through the reduction rules that we look at. We look at your most recent year and compare it to the average of the previous two years. So really we're looking for an improvement in, in the most recent year. And we need to... Uh, well, I mean, it's essentially two ways you can pass. The one is either on an absolute basis, so as long as your most recent year is lower than the average of the previous two, or on a relative basis with a minimum improvement of 2.5% per annum. It all gets a little bit technical, but essentially we have a spreadsheet which you can populate, and the spreadsheet will do the calculation for you and say whether you pass or fail on an absolute or relative basis. Uh, relative benchmarks are, are, are something we need to discuss always. Uh, they are very controversial and something that um, uh, I think a lot of critics of carbon management are picking on increasingly.
So generally turnover is accepted as being a good measure of the output of the organization. We would consider other metrics. If you're a factory manufacturing widgets, it would be the number of widgets produced would be quite satisfactory. But as organizations become more and more diverse, it becomes difficult to find another benchmark that, that's really suitable. But all of those are available for, for, for consideration. But essentially, we'd need to agree on that with you beforehand. So that's the measurement, the management, and uh, sorry, the, the measurement, the reduction. Now, the third area is the management, and this is more of a qualitative process. And really, what, what you're looking for is evidence of good practice um, of, of actual carbon management. Uh, we look at three key areas. The first one is governance. So we look at who, at, over, at a senior level in the organization, board level typically, is taking responsibility for your organizational footprint. The second area is carbon accounting, what processes and procedures you have in place to capture from information from billing data or, or how you're measuring it and bring it into your final figures. And then the third area is the activities that you're doing on a daily basis to reduce your, your actual uh, carbon emissions. So that could be investments into energy savings technologies or just good practice, staff training, uh, good communication, um, a number of, number of things qualify for, for, for that. And it's essential that, that you need to, to, to have compliance in all three areas um, in order to be able to, to achieve the standard. How does the process actually work? We generally suggest that you link it to your financial year end. Um, main reason for that is if you're benchmarking against turnover, that you have your financial figures available at the same time. But you could, in theory, move it to any particular reporting period you'd like to. Generally, after a, day, after a year ended, we find most organizations take two to three weeks to, to oh, sorry, two to three months to, to get the data together. Um, and at that stage, it's important to start talking to, to us and saying that whether you are ready to apply or not. And essentially, we don't want to put organiza organizations into the process and fail them. So what we do is encourage you to populate the spreadsheets here that you can show, demonstrate the reductions, and you can also show that you've got good carbon management programs in place. Um, only when, when you're at the stage where you're reasonably confident that you, you'll be able to, to achieve a standard would we issue with a proposal. <coughs> After signing a proposal, the process normally takes six to eight weeks for most organizations. Um, we, we allow three months, uh, generally, so that uh, it, it gives you a bit of a safety buffer, but our experience is, is six to eight weeks. We have done some organizations in, the, in, in as little as two weeks. So the, the actual assessment time is measured in, in, in days. Um, there's two processes you can follow. The one is what we call certification only, where you complete the spreadsheet and assessment form um, and do everything yourselves, understand the rules and, and the requirements. You complete that and the assessor comes in like, uh, as an examiner at the end of the process and essentially marks it for you. The other route and the one that we generally recommend is the assistant certification. That's where the assessor handholds you through the process. Uh, fills in the assessment form, or helps you fill in the assessment form and spreadsheet, and guides you through all of the um, specific areas that, that you've got unique situations in your organization. <coughs> the timeline at the bottom is the nine month uh, expiry date on your data. So we need to be looking at data that's less than nine months old. So we, we can't be validating an organization uh, with, with three year old worth of data, for example. Um, so generally, any organization that has a March year-end would need to get through certification by December of that year. And some of the organizations that have achieved the standard, um, these are just some of the names who've now got 100 and just close to 160 organizations that have through certification and 250 have signed up. The, remain, the difference between the two numbers are the remainder of the organizations that are being assessed at the moment. And we've had a huge uptake recently, um, and certainly in the last month, um, we, we added another 40 to that. So there's certainly a lot of interests. But I think um, what I really wanted to, to, to finish off on was uh, you know, essentially what happens beyond the CRC. And I think really what, what, what we'd like to focus on is the, some of the, the issues that were just discussed this morning about reputation. I don't know if anybody saw the article in the Sunday Times this week, but um, the journalist picked up on a number, number of organizations 
that aren't carrying their footprint and aren't actually doing terribly much in terms of, of reducing their footprints. Um, and I, I think there's going to be, it's, it's going to become an increasingly competitive issue. And this is going to be the differentiator that, 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 that can help you to achieve additional sales, bring on additional customers, um, help uh, keep employees happy, et cetera. And particularly for investor engagement, it's becoming part of due diligence processes for, uh, for, for, for investments. The graph on the right hand side is a survey we conducted uh, last year and, and essentially shows that 70% of consumers want to buy from green companies, but only 5% understand green claims. And that's got to be a huge opportunity for organisations. Uh, clearly, there, there are customers out there who either don't understand or don't believe what organisations are saying about themselves. And that just increases the need for uh, verification or validation from an external party. And organisations have, have essentially communicated in a number of ways. Um, the first, if, first way, obviously, is, is you achieve a certificate. Uh, but organisations then use, use every possible means they can to communicate, either on their websites. Uh, we've got organisations who display it on their business cards. Um, yeah, the, the, the uh, number of companies have done a lot of media advertising in the printed media. So really, these companies see the benefit of, of communicating that and actually differentiating themselves from the rest of the market. I see I'm running close to, to my time limit, so I'm going to just skip over these two case studies. But the first one is First Direct, which is the first bank, uh, which is the online bank of, of HSBC to achieve the standard. And they've made a huge investment into printed media advertising. Um, they've not only saved money and saved carbon, but they're actually getting a, a, a large increase in, in their customer interest because of it. The interesting thing is the motivation for, for, for the carbon dust standard didn't come from the CRC, but actually came from employees wanting to work for a green organization. Very different company is a, small co is, is a company in Northern Ireland, which is a manufacturing company, and also save a lot of carbon, save a lot of money. Their motivation was from customers and the supply chain pressure. So essentially, I think what, what the, the message I'd like to leave with you is, you're doing the work, you're, doing the, you're able to show the reductions, you've got the certification, you may as well use it, and get a business advantage over your, your competitors. And I think that leaves me about five minutes for questions.